The first don't of a relationship, and, and one that's probably the most common, is the belief that our partner should meet our needs and wants at all times. And even worse, they should know what they are. They, we should never have to make a request for them again, and they should read our mind. Like, that's kind of three in one. In almost every relationship I deal with clients all the time, they go, but I've told them, they know this is important to me. Well, did you hear the sentence? The last part of the sentence, this is important to me. See, yes, it's important to you, but it doesn't mean it's important to them. And that doesn't make them a bad person. Now I'm talking about a reasonable person, not a narcissist, a sociopath, you know, not evil, but a reasonable person. It's not their job. Their life is filled with other things. Their life is filled with their own needs that, that they're trying to meet. And so our partners are human. They get overloaded with their own pursuits. And so, yes, they're going to forget that we love something and we want it all the time. And so in, in the poor relationship, there's this demand, this perfectionist demand that they should know and they should give it. And it's their job. I call that the Kardashian model of relationships. I, you see that in reality TV, that if you love me, you should just give me what I want and meet my needs. And that's love. And it's not. That's codependence. It's manipulative. It's incredibly destructive. And it's incredibly unhealthy. It is never, ever, ever our partner's job to meet our needs and wants. It's wonderful when they do. And it's wonderful when we picked a partner who our needs and wants line up. And so primarily they're contributing to those. But if you're with a partner that doesn't meet them, that's not about your partner. That's about yourself. And we're going to get to, you know, further down, you're going to see why you ended up with a partner, but that's us. We need to look at ourselves of why did I pick a partner that doesn't meet a lot of my needs and wants? It doesn't like it doesn't align for them. They don't even see them or recognize them as important. That's about me, not my partner. Number two, this, because of the cause, which I'll get to in a minute, the number two don't is we can't trust. And so we need to control, we need to spy, we need to snoop. We're constantly on our partner's back. What are you doing? Who's that texting you? What's that about? Where are you going? You can't do that. You can't go hang out with your family and friends. No, we're constantly putting the latches on them because of our own fears, our own abandonment issues, uh, the, our own insecurities. We can't trust in the others. And so again, that's not about them, even though they may have been perfectly imperfect. The solution, which we'll get to, is we have an inherent fear of trusting others, which means we can't trust ourselves. And that was learned. And again, I'm going to get to where that was learned. Okay. Um, that leads to the third don't, which is a lack of trust in anyone general in the world that people are inherently bad, inherently deceptive. Remember on the positive side, they see the world is generally good. People are imperfect, but there's plenty of people out there to love me. There's plenty of people that I will find on the converse side. We, they see everyone is danger. Everyone is a problem. Everything is, um, out to get them and therefore they can't trust anyone. Okay. So that's the third don't. The fourth is a basic belief that they are unlovable and unworthy of love. And that shows up in those first three. You see, if they're expecting somebody else to meet their needs and wants, if they're expecting constant affirmation, if they're trying to control and spy, there's this sense that there's something bad and defective in me. And so I have to make sure I have to control. I have to be hyper vigilant and, and be all over this person to make sure they love me. That those are the demands. And so while you, you may sit there and feel, Oh no, I love myself. Cause I get that a lot. Oh, I have terribly high self-esteem and yet they're, living all of these don'ts in their relationship. They're detached from how their behaviors are actual, actual proof that they're struggling with self-love and self-acceptance. 
And that's one of the biggest culprits in relationships is um, people don't generally have an awareness of how much they shame themselves and how much they belittle themselves and how much they're exercising these don'ts. And that's a sign, that's a clear indication that they're struggling with self-love, okay? And they have a hard, a very hard time admitting that, okay? So that's the fourth don't. The fifth is no one will love me unless I put up with this bad behavior. You wonder why people stay in abusive relationships. I had a client this morning. She's, every session she's called me and said, I've broken up with my boyfriend for the last time. And the next session starts with how they got back together, went on a vacation, how he said these things, did these things, and the violence in the relationship is escalating. This last week, it got physical, and yet she keeps going back. Well, that's a product of the lack of love for herself. We think we will minimize those bad behaviors because we feel like unless I somehow condone this, I won't get the love that I'm after, all right? <clears throat> that leads into the next one. I need constant affirmation from my partner, constant approval and affirmation. I can't hear criticism. I can't be wrong. They can't. They always have to have my back in disagreements with friends or family or anyone. I need constant support. Well, I've used this example before and it's very extreme, but it, I use it because it brings home the point. If we believe that our partner is supposed to meet our needs and wants all the time, is supposed to constantly affirm us, constantly have our back, always support us, never go against us. Well, do you see what that opens the door to? What if your partner came to you and said, you know, I've decided I'm a little bored in life and so I'm gonna become a serial killer. And every Wednesday night, I'm gonna go out and do that. I just, I want a little pep in my step. Well, if we're supposed to always meet our partner's needs and wants, if we're always supposed to support them, if we're always supposed to have their back and affirm them, then we have to be okay with that. And I know you're like, oh, I'd never put up with that. Well, or I'd never ask that. Well, if you believe you deserve some, your partner to constantly support you, that's in essence what you're advocating is that level of extreme. Because frankly, like I'm sure you're a great person, but you're perfectly imperfect and some behaviors are just not okay. They're not worthy of supporting because we go again, we're, we're going to make beautiful mistakes in our life. And so it's loving for our partner not to support us in those moments, but to lovingly confront us, confront us and say, you know, that wasn't your best moment, okay? So that's the, the I um, uh, can't remember where I am, the sixth one, I think, um, or the fifth one. The sixth one is I must sacrifice everything for my partner. You see this all the time. People will give up their friends, their hobbies, their careers, their families. I did that. I did, I did almost all of these don'ts. I thought my, you know, my first wife should meet all my needs. I couldn't trust anyone. Um, I, I thought I should always get supported. I thought I should never be criticized. Um, I thought I had to sacrifice and do everything for my partner and put up with bad behavior. Look, she was physically and verbally abusive and I put up with it. I gave up my friends, my family. I went 10 years without seeing my family. I did all of these every single one of them because that's what I was taught was love that's what we're all taught well and you wonder why you know the divorce rate is what it is and we're all unhappy in our relationships this is why number seven is we don't know our our needs and wants our morals and values and our negotiables and non-negotiables this was definitely me in my first marriage I literally remember as a kid laying on my bed thinking I wonder who will marry me. I wonder if she'll be nice. I wonder if she'll be pretty. I had no idea that I could ever decide what my morals and values were, what my needs and wants were, and what was negotiable and non-negotiable. I spent, you know, what did we marry? 27, 28 years old. I was just waiting for someone to pick me and 
they could be whatever they wanted as long as they picked me. I guess this is the one. That's the biggest pitfall I see people in relationships is they never sat down and asked those questions of themselves. What do I, like she and I didn't believe that we, our morals and values on politics, religion, sex, like every area of our life never lined up. Now, remember earlier I said, we're expecting these things and we're in a relationship and we're going, oh my God, my partner's the problem. Well, no, we never sat down and mapped out. Oh my God, I picked up a partner who doesn't share my morals and values. Like she was a drug addict. I, I'm like anti-drug. Like literally every area of our life, we had the complete opposite morals and values. Well, that's because I never sat down and no one ever taught me that I needed to be responsible for these things. Well, how could she meet my needs and wants if her morals and values are exactly the opposite? Then the question is, is that negotiable or non-negotiable? Well, now, now that I know what my morals and values are, now I know how to ask for my needs and wants, that is non-negotiable. I won't tolerate that, you know? I can see a great looking woman, but she has some of those things. I'm like, nope, I won't allow it. Cause for me, that would be bad behavior. I won't allow that. Remember that's a do. We don't allow that when we have a healthy relationship, okay? Number eight is about boundaries. In a healthy, loving relationship, the a person believes that boundaries are essential. They are the basis of a great relationship and that no is the most beautiful thing you can ever say in a relationship. Because look at what happens in relationships. Why do they break up? Every time you listen to somebody talk about a divorce or a relationship ending, every time they go, I did so much for them. I did this and I did this and I did this. And all I ever asked, I just asked this one thing, would you do this for me? And they would never do it. Well, what does that mean? That means we did all of these things in the hopes of manipulating. Because remember the sacrifice, all these false beliefs we've been taught. Love, I'm supposed to give them whatever they want, sacrifice everything. But if it goes against our morals and values, needs and wants, negotiables and non-negotiables, we'll throw it in their face, we'll keep score, and we'll eventually resent them. And so all of these things that we did, we didn't want to. They went against our morals and values, our needs and wants, our negotiables and non-negotiables. And the proof of that is that we're throwing it in their face, we kept score, and we resent them for it. That's the proof. Okay? And that's why no is the most loving word we can ever say to our partner because now I know you're not going to throw this back in my face and beat me up how you were so nice to me. Like that, that was the one I did. My ex loved to garage sale and that, I tell you, you want to kill me, make me go to a garage sale. I've just never understood it. You're rifling through pe people's things that they want to throw in the trash. Like, I just don't get it. But under the guise of sacrifice and supporting my partner and meeting their needs and wants and, you know, oh, I love you. I would sit in that car for hours on the weekend. And then, man, the, at night, I would be passive aggressive, snotty comments, cold, shut down. I'd take it out on her. Now you tell me where the love is in that. But it was the best I could do. I didn't know all this information. And so if you're hearing yourself in this, don't shame yourself. Recognize, hey, I did the best I could. Now I'm, I'm here listening to this. I'm learning the new information. I'm going to make a commitment from this day forward to love myself and love my partner. And I'm going to start saying no. I'm going to start setting boundaries because this has got to stop. Okay? Number nine. This is... Um, the, one of the, the people that get trampled on that say they've been trampled on and aren't getting their needs and wants met, they tend to have this don't in their language and their belief system. They tend to feel the, tre a tremendous sense of recognition, power, and joy from rescuing, enabling, and saving their partner. This was me. My ex was a pill addict and I drive all across the state, going to her friend's house, lying to drug um, pharmacies, lying to doctors, trying to get her more pills. 
I totally enabled her addiction nonstop. But here I was, oh, you poor thing, you're hurting. I'll go rescue. And maybe if I do this, she'll finally have sex with me. It was all a manipulation. I wasn't kind and loving. I was trying to be the rescuer. And so those people that, you know, are the constant, they give themselves away to do so much for somebody else. It's actually a false power dynamic because they can harbor and sit in the resentment and they never have to face that they're manipulating because they can constantly blame the partner. That's what I did. Look at what I do for her. I gave up my, I get, this is what I used to say. I, I quit pro hockey for her. I gave up my family. I gave up sex. I changed careers. I changed my whole life for her. And she won't even have sex with me. She won't even say anything. She won't stop hitting me. Look at how manipulative I was. Oh my gosh. Now I'm not condoning any of her behaviors. And I'm not condoning your partner if they're, you know, being less than perfect like she was or even abusive. But because we didn't teach ourselves, we didn't go learn about the do's, about boundaries, about what a true healthy relationship is. Because we chose not to become an expert in that, we are responsible. We have to take ownership of that. That's the only way to change this, okay? And finally, number 10, relationships should be avoided. You see this, I see this all the time. People are like, oh, I'm done with the relationships. Men, women are just liars and cheaters. Remember, they don't trust the world. This is the 10th don't. And so just be avoided or they won't open up to their partner. They won't be vulnerable. It doesn't matter anyway. They don't care. Um, no one, no one cares about my thoughts and feelings. No one's worthy being a trust, worthy of my trust. Um, I'm just going to avoid them and avoid the relationship. Well, that's no relationship is possible with avoidance. So finally we get down to what causes all of this. Well, the biggest reason most people live their relationship life in the 10 don'ts is because of poor attachment with their parents in childhood. Look, I know everyone wants this to be about anything but childhood. We want it to be about the partner and oh, well, they should know they're an adult, but they don't. And, and even if they learn about this stuff, unless you go back and heal your childhood trauma, you have no shot. And I do these videos and everything because I'm really trying to break down the stigma. All of us, any problem in our life, anything that's so-called bad about us that we think is bad or whatever it is, it's all learned in childhood. All of our problems are learned in childhood. The 10 don'ts were false attachment coping skills we developed because of our parents' perfect imperfections, because for centuries we've never taught how to be a parent, we've never taught about relationships. And so they were survival mechanisms. We had to adopt these 10 don'ts just to survive unconscionable pain and trauma and abandonment, enmeshment, all these different dynamics that all of us have been through. Nobody on this planet is immune from childhood trauma. Nobody, nobody. And I, I have been on podcasts with people who argue with me about that. I was on a podcast, this girl, she told her whole life story and her whole life story was she was going to become a lawyer because her parents wanted to. And her mom's still running her life, running her podcast, running her business. Her mom is running her whole life. And she refused to see and admit that her trauma, all of her struggles in her life are because of the enmeshed abandonment, the, the abandonment from her father who demanded she be a lawyer and the enmeshment of her mother who overempowered her, that she's still trying to please her parents. And, and that, you know, I found out later, you know, her mother was upset with me because mom doesn't want to take ownership that she was perfectly imperfect. And that's just everybody. That's where all of this comes from. Now I know it's uncomfortable and, and I know I'm not always the best at communicating it. I know that the words I choose sometimes come, it's, it comes out as harsh or demeaning or critical. It's not my heart. 
I read like Gabor Mate and some other people who talk about this stuff and their words are so elegant and so loving. My heart is to be elegant and loving about it, but I tend to be really direct and it comes out harsh. And that's not my heart. I'm not trying to blame parents. This isn't about blame. Our parents can't be blamed because we've never taught any of this. They can be held accountable, which is boundaries and loving, that they chose not to learn about it, but they can't be blamed. So I'm not trying to shame your parents or shame you as a parent because you've taught your kids this as well. Whatever struggles you see in your kid's life, you've taught them this. We have to own that. My goal is to just break the wall of denial down. And my heart is to try and do it in a loving way where you go, you know what? He's right. I mean, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child says it adverse childhood experience, like every scientific process out there says all of it is childhood. If you're not addressing childhood trauma, you're not addressing the issue. Any relationship program, anything that doesn't make you an expert in overcoming your childhood trauma is not giving you the solution to live you the life you want. And that's my passion is I want you to have the life you want. And so if I come across harsh, it's only because I have a passion that somebody finally teaches what it's really about because I almost lost my life. I almost killed myself because I'd been searching for 30 years. And what I discovered is all the gurus, all the people in this industry won't talk about the real problem. And that's what frustrated me with my own life. And so that's the directness that comes out. So. I beg your forgiveness. I'm still working on it, still trying to find the better language so I can communicate it in a way that you feel loved and cared for and you go, dang it, he's right. I'm going to go work on this because that's, that's all I want is for people to go, you know what, I'm going to work on this because I know how scary it is to make that jump. To go, gosh, I don't want to admit my parents were imperfect. I don't want to admit that I was imperfect as a parent. Oh, that sounds too scary, too rough. I can tell you this, if you decide to do it, I have yet to see one person whose life hasn't exploded with joy, happiness, and tremendous things in their life. It's never failed. And so if that's what you really want, in my life experience, it's the only way out. And that's what I want for you.